I think the recording is done. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. All right, so let's begin. So again, I'm Josie Harris Walton. Um, I'm a tax attorney. I am the attorney that will be speaking on business entity um, overview structuring in Vegas. That's one of my topics I'll be doing. I am a tax attorney. I deal with, um, everybody knows, I, most of the people know me as dealing with tax professionals. I also handle corporate um, cases, corporate litigation cases, as well as some audits. Um, not very many odds. I kind of let the enroll agents handle that. You guys know how that is. I kind of do nothing but litigation. So I handle, I handle a lot of my stuff off to um, enroll agents. All right. So we're going to begin. I don't know if Melinda's she said, let me know if I she need anything. So she, uh, hey, I, I guess. Hey, I guess I everybody. I'm here. I am. Let me turn my camera on. Hi, I'm in California in my mastermind this week. So I'm here, but I have to log off early because I got to go back in in 30 minutes. Okay. Um, Hopefully, it, I don't think it'll end the meeting because I made you the host. We'll see. Okay. Cool beans. And so we won't, we won't have any questions. Okay. That's fine. Maybe um, I'll yes, I'll, oh. I'll have, I'll do the first three um, trivia questions before I log off. Okay, sounds good. All right, okay. let me begin. All right. All right. Okay. All right, let's begin. All right, so we're going to talk about the common types of business entities, right, tonight. We're going to talk about sole proprietors, um, partnerships, LLCs, S corporations, um, qualified joint ventures. Trust and estates, and you know, nonprofit, but I'm not sure if it's on there, so I'm not gonna talk about nonprofit tonight. But these are the common types of business entities when you're dealing with clients, these are the ones you'll most likely be handling. So, we want to go over those tonight. This is just kind of like a snippet of what we're gonna do. It's gonna, it's a whole lot of stuff, and doing the um, doing Vegas, but we're gonna go, to, we're gonna talk about these really quick tonight, okay? So, proprietor. I'm gonna be honest with you, I am not a fan of sole proprietorship. I believe everybody should be a you know registered with their state, but hey, some people are sole proprietors. So you probably will get people who are sole proprietors on the um on the um exam. They're gonna talk about sole proprietors. There's gonna be information about them. They are an unincorporated business entity. So unincorporated means that they are not incorporated in with their state. They are by themselves, you know, most people use a social security number, which I don't know why. Most people use a social security number when there's a sole proprietorship. There's nothing wrong with getting an EIN number to do that. But you pretty much the person, the taxpayer owns the risk. They take the risk also as well as the Schedule C. That is where the uh, personal tax returns go on the, the business returns go for a sole proprietor is on the Schedule C um, Form 1040. Everyone knows that, I'm pretty sure. All right, so that is one of the, that's the unincorporated one. That is, and I think is another one, which is the joint venture, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So partnership. Partnership is pretty much two or more people who join and carry on a business. Everyone knows a partnership. What partnerships are in this, this is another thing about partnerships, which is so cool, is that partnerships, you know, you have a contract. So if you are, you say, okay, I want to be a partner 30%, 40%. You got to know, you got to ask your clients these questions. Hey, are you 40% owner? Are you 50% owner? Are you 6% owner? And that's according to how much income you get and how much liability you have. And so, but you also have limited partnerships who are not responsible for personal debts. But one thing about partnerships that a lot of people do not like is the fact that partnerships, if you are not a limited partner, then you're responsible for the company's debt. Partnerships, everyone know is not is a it's a annual informational return. The 1065 is annual, it's informational, and it also um it provides like income, expenses, and things like that. Then it flows over to, so it's a pass through. It flows over to the partner's schedule. Is it on it's a schedule E, but it's on the schedule K1. I don't know, you probably get yeah, I probably can figure that way. A schedule a 1065 K1. That's what that's what the Partnerships gives the partners, the partners flow it over to their Schedule E on their personal returns. That is how partnerships work. Now, I like to go into little things with partnerships. Um, I get a lot of partnership issues come on my way. 
not in the tax realm in a sense, but in the, well, I guess it is tax realm because contracts. So you're in a partnership contract and someone says, I don't want to work with that person anymore, or I don't have that debt, or I'm not going to pay that debt in the partnership or whatever. Um, you can have different issues going on with that. That's one of the main things about partnerships, as well as you want, you know, you're buying as a partner, you got your contracts. If something happens to you, um, things of that nature, the partnership can dissolve, or you could have a, like a, a husband, a wife owning a partnership with another business. It's a lot of things dealing with partnership of what tax purposes. For tax purposes, pretty much the partnership 1065, um, you file that return. And of course, it flows over to your personal return on the Schedule E. A lot of partnerships, to, a lot of people, I don't can't believe a lot of people don't know they're supposed to be have filed 1065. And you can get a penalty for not filing the information return. And that's what a lot of companies do not understand. You can get a penalty for not filing. Because it's a, even though it's an informational return, you still need to file it. And most of them are filed. I think they talked about it before, you know, that they filed by, by what, March 31st. Okay, yeah. And so that's the, the oh, March 15th. One of, um, that is, but it's in March. That is one of the main things that people mess up on is the fact that they don't file the partnership returns and then the partnership doesn't give them a K-1 and then they didn't know. It, it's a lot of stuff dealing with that. But for our purposes and for the fact of doing this particular, um, the EA exam, we're going to go into the partnership of two or more people who join to carry on a business and they actually have to flow over. I had a situation where we did, a, um, I was doing a audit for someone and a, a personal audit and found out the person has supposed to have a 1065 K1. They said, oh, I got partnership income. No, no K1 was ever done. So how, how are you supposed to audit that? So they had to go back and do the K1s and then it was, it was additional income on them. So make sure you know, and make sure you ask people when they're, they're saying their partnership, okay, where's your schedule K1? Where's your 1065 schedule K1? All right. The next one is, a qualified joint venture. That's a beautiful couple right there, huh? Beautiful couple. This is a, joint, a qualified joint venture um, is husband and wife. Husband and wife are, they're the only members of that joint venture. They are considered a qualified joint venture. They can actually, people People always just say, oh, oh all partners have to file 1065. But if you are a partner with your with your spouse, then you can be you can be a qualified joint venture and you guys can file a schedule on, on a schedule C. You don't have to file a 1065. I learned that by going to court. I went to I went to court on the the IRS swear to my client to file a 1065. They did not have to file a 1065. It's like, no, and they I actually won that in court. So you probably will see a case out there with um me winning that in court because they were a partnership, they were real estate, they own real estate, they own a lot of um real estate. And they were husband and wife, and they they filed Schedule C's. Well, the IRS said that they were supposed to file 1065. I'm like, no, they're a qualified joint venture. And it, you know, I think it's it's like, and it's one of the unincorporated business too, because it's not one of the ones where you're gonna find on the state website. It's not going to be on the state website where you can check joint venture, like for instance, an LLC, a corporation, a partnership. You can, you know, those are incorporated in the Secretary of State. This one's not incorporated. It's one that's dealing with the IRS. What, what disclosure has to, oh, what disclosure has to accompany the Schedule C when the EIN says it's about? What, did, and you can't tell me. You can't tell me what disclosure has to occupy the, oh, the, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, the qualified. Thank you, thank you, thank you, George. See, George, see, see how, see how all of us do? That's right. That's right. The QJV has to pass. If 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 they file a Schedule C, when the EIN is on the 1065, they have to have a JV they, JV form, right? That's that's that. Do that, if it, is it a JV form or is this just a disclosure on the Schedule C? George, tell me that. Y'all know y'all are the ones who file tax returns. I need to know how it goes so we can know how it goes. Cause I can't, I can't remember. But George gonna come and tell us in a minute when he get, when he get a chance. He gonna come and tell us in a minute. So that, so don't forget about that. What disclosure has to occupy the Schedule C when the EIN says 1065? 
the QJV. That's what it is. QJV. Don't forget about that. Qualified Joint Ventures. Because what happened was I won this case and in there because they did not file a Schedule C. They, well, they filed a Schedule C, but the, the IRS said they should have filed a 1065. All right. So remember that. And also don't forget that if, if there's any other partners involved in the in the um the partnership is not a qualified joint venture. It has to be, and we got a poll. Under which circumstances is an entity required to apply for a new employee employee identification number? Oh, I think I got that in my um. All right, people, what's the answer? All right, the answer is D. When it incorporates, when a, uh, oh, that's that you know that, that's a you know, that's a trick question. It that is a really good question. That's a good question, Melinda. So, under which circumstances is an entity required to apply for a new employer identification number? So the first one is bit is business name change. We know that's not correct because you can actually um, send a letter in um, for. And ask for the business to be changed instead of EIN number. 50%, um, well, 20% said 50% change of interest in partnership within 12 months. No, you don't have to do an EIN, a new EIN number for that. Electing or revoking S corporation status. Remember, that's a 2553. That's the form you use for that. And then so D is the only other option. Remember when you're doing the questions, you got to my what my recommendation would be to check off the ones we know that's not right, right? We know business name change was not correct. We know B was not correct. Oh, thank you, George, for that. Um, and so C and e, D may have been the ones that look everybody struggle with, right? But then electing or revoking, and when it says electing, you know the 2553 is when you elect for an S corporation status. So you know that couldn't be it. Boom. There you go. D is the answer. Because if an LLC incorporates with a state, they now need to file an a, a um for the SS4 which is the form. Don't forget SS4, even though it's SS4, you, you, if you think SS4, you, you, it is something that you actually do online, but it's it, but it's still an SS4 form. So when you receive your letter saying you receive your EIN number, it says SS4 at the top. All right, these are, the, this is the, and I, don't, I think, I'm sorry, I wasn't sharing you guys. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so, George, let me know that it's the form that for the disclosure form is eight two seven five. Don't forget eight two seven five. If you if there's a um, if you you it needs to be occupied with a Schedule C. If uh, if the EIN number says ten sixty five, okay. Don't forget that. So somebody says no new e. So no new EIN if going from a sole. No 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 no. So, well, oh, you do, but think about this. You're not going to go from a sole proprietor to an S corp. You're going to go, if you only can go from an LLC or a corporation to a, or a partner to an S corp, you can't go from a sole, sole proprietor because sole proprietor is not incorporated. So you got to incorporate it first. Then you got to file the, e, then you got to file for an EIN number. Then you can file the 2553. Because remember, only certain people, so only certain entities can go from a entity to an S corp, be elected to be an S corp. A sole, sole proprietor is, is a, is a um, non a unincorporated business entity, so it can't do that. So remember that, Karen. Yeah, it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. LLC will be issued the EIN, new EIN number. Then you can file a 2553, but a sole proprietor is not an LLC. A sole proprietor is an unincorporated entity. Or, oh, yeah, the 8332, which is the corporation to an S Corp. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. And so, like I said before, qualified joint venture conducts a trade of business where only, only, only the husband and wife is in the joint venture. Both spouses participate in the trade of business. Most of the time you're going to see this to me is real estate. 
I see a lot of real estate. Both spouses elect not to be treated as a partnership, which I'm assuming that's that disclosure. And then the business is co-owned by both, both spouses, not just in the name of one spouse, in the name of the other spouse. It has to be, both spouses has to be co-owners of the business. All right, corporation. That's a group of people that decide they're gonna, or not even a group of people, but when they say group of people, but that's a group that decides to be a corporation. It can be individuals, it can be association, it can be company, it can be partnership, trust. Anyone, anyone can be a, a shareholder of a corporation, except, you know, there are some exceptions, but anyone can be a corporation, of, anyone can be a shareholder of a corporation. And then a corporation is taxed by itself. We know that's the 1120S. It pays taxes on itself. Its shareholders, if the shareholders end up having a distribution as dividends, they are also taxed on that. That's double taxation. And of course, shareholders cannot take a um, deduction loss of the corporation. They also, with, with you know, certain qualified dividends, they cannot take, the corporation cannot take a deduction from those. That's why a lot of people don't like to do qualified dividends because it's double taxed. So just remember that. Corporations, 1120s, I'm sorry, 1120s. Um, but if a corporation decided or a partnership or an LLC decides they do not, they don't want to be taxed that way, they can be taxed as an S Corp, which is a small corporation um, that is a pass-through. And then also I forgot to put on there, which George already put on there, an entity must elect to be a tax, tax as an S corporation using form 2553, or if you're a corporation, 8332. I forgot to add that on there. Thank you, George. And they filed 1120S is an informational return as well. The shareholders file their, um, they get 1120S K1. They file that on their tax returns, on their personal tax returns under Schedule E. Limited liability company, which is pretty much, it's an entity where you form a, under the Secretary of State of your state, um, as an LLC, you are your members are not personally liable for their um, your debts, um, and also you can be so most of the time a small a single member a single member is a dis disregarded entity, right? Single entity as an LLC. If it's multiple multiple partners of the LLC, it defaults for tax purposes. Think about this for you. You're always talking about tax purposes. For tax purposes, it's a partnership. Unless, of course, you, like I said, it is a qualified joint venture. So remember that LLCs, if it's a single member, it's a disregard entity, it's the LLC. It has the EIN number. That's when it gets this EIN number. And then it is considered on the Schedule C. If you have multiple members, it defaults for, for tax purposes, partnerships. So which means you file a 1065 unless you are a husband and wife only and you're the only ones in the business and you are, are both materially participating in the business, at that time, you file, and you can file a Schedule C. Here's another polling question. An employer identification is always required for all the following except. One more person to one more person answer. The answer is C. An employer identification number, which is an EIN, is always required for all of the following except is C, a sole proprietor with no employees. Remember, let's go through a let's go through the, 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 the answers, right? <clears throat> you know a corporation has to file. We know that. We know a partnership has to file, right? The only two that may be left is the nonprofit organization because, of course, they're not taxed. So you could think, okay, maybe the, the nonprofit organization would be the one. But then you also have sole, sole proprietorship with no employees. Remember, if you are a, um, if you are, if you actually, to be honest, if you are, if you have, if you are, you have employees, you have to file and you have to file for an EIN. That's the only way you can actually um, tax your employees is having an employee identification number. 
it says employer identification number. That means you're an employer, you have employees. Therefore, that, ta that takes out the nonprofit organization and then now you have a sole proprietorship with no employees. That is the only person, and remember, except, a, and, and maybe that person thought about, maybe it was like, they, they, they didn't see except. So an employer identification, EIN is always required for all following except, except. And a nonprofit, a nonprofit organization has to have an EIN number because it has to register as a under the 1063. Okay? All right. I think I keep forgetting to show the results, but I think that's that's that's, that's Melinda. Okay, cool. All right, next, next, next. All right, so trust. So we're gonna talk a little bit about trust in the states. Of course, a trust, which we're not talking about grantor trust. Don't think about that, because that's that's a whole different trust. This is a separate legal entity for a tax for federal tax purposes. A taxpayer may create a trust while alive, which is a um a not what is it living trust or upon death by means of a will, which is a, a regular trust in a will, which can be an estate, okay? So therefore we have trust, you guys know there are trust tax returns out there. And of course, Josie do not remember the form. And I love forms, but I do not remember the form. I think it was a 10, 1041, just to make sure. But anyway, a trust that, so you gotta think about when you, get, when you have an issue where there's a trust or you have a question about a trust, remember, it is a, it's a separate legal entity for federal tax purposes. It is because a trust has to have an EIN number because it's a legal entity and it has to be taxed. In order for it to be taxed, it has to have an EIN number, even though sole proprietors don't, but still, you still have to have some kind of way because a, a trust is separate by itself. When you are a trustee of a trust, you're going to have to file a, 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 a trust ta tax return because a trust can be taxed. So don't let nobody tell you a trust cannot be taxed. A trust definitely can be taxed. Remember that, okay? But always remember with a trust, it is separate by itself for federal tax purposes, and it can be taxed. And it's two forms, living trust or doing a will. With You know, a will can create a trust. You can, they, you know, in the will, it can says, this person, you know, I'm going to put all this money for this person. For most of the time with a will, with that situation, it's most likely like a child who needs to have a trust and they're going to put that, they're going to move the money from the wheel, um, from the estate into the trust. And that's the next thing that we're going to talk about is the estate. So the estate is, that's when someone passed away, their descendants receive their, um, their uh, any money that's inside of the estate. The good, the, not a good thing, but nothing good about the estate, but the, the estate is also a separate legal entity for federal tax purposes. You have to file as the estate, if you are the, um, the executor of the estate, you have to file executors, you have to file the estate taxes. People do not realize, you have, and you also have to have an EIN number. I represented um, a couple of people who have estates, like their parents passed away, they have an estate, and you have to actually have to get an EIN number for that estate, and you actually have to file taxes for that estate every year until that estate, until that estate is dissolved. And that estate is, a state is dissolved when the court says that, that you've done everything you're supposed to do as the executor. So the executor is the one who files the estate taxes or the estate form, and maybe that's 1041, the estate form for the estate. So it's a lot of work. People don't people want to be executors of estate, they don't realize it's a lot of work. What are the penalties for not filing the exec in a state? I'm not sure, but I don't I don't think there's a penalty, but I'm gonna find out for you, Karen. And and you have, I have, I have, I'll have a client with three years. Okay. I'm going to find out for you though. I can find out real quick. I don't, I don't think there's one. The issue is, is that you, the, the issue that they're going to have, and this is not taxes, but the issue they're going to have is when they get ready to close the estate, the courts are going to want to see that you file the estate information um, and you file the estate taxes, but I'm, I'm going to see And I got, I'm gonna have my, I know my trusted, my trusted. Okay, we'll, um, we'll discuss that in detail when we go over penalties. Oh, okay. You got, you got that already. Okay, cool. Yep. You know me, I just like looking up stuff. All right. So, uh, no. okay. Now, see, she, I got, she, see, she gave y'all, she gave y'all the answers already. And I, I was getting to that. But, um, Melinda gave y'all the answer on, 
identification number. So these are the people who have to file an SS4. Remember, even though we're saying that SS4, remember that is where you file online. You go online, RSI.gov, you put in EIN, and you, you go there. It is, you have to have one or more employees. File tax returns for employer or excise taxes, maintain a qualified retirement plan, or operate as a corporation, partnership, nonprofit, estate, or trust. So, yeah, Melinda Melinda gave y'all the um, the answer first before I got to it. But that's okay. That's okay. But, yeah, these that's the reason why she was saying. <laughs> that's why she, we, we were talking about that. It, it, would, it would be the sole proprietor who does not have employees because of the fact that all the rest of them, corporation, partnership, nonprofit, estate, and, or trust, has to have an EIN number. All right. Let's, now, so we talked about all of the entities that we, we talked about most of the entities. You know, there are, and we got a polling question. Which of the following is an advantage of forming a limited liability company as opposed to a partnership? Which of the following is an advantage of forming a limited liability company as opposed to a partnership? All right, um, I only got six participants. Come on, give me an answer. Give me an answer, people. Let me give you all. Let me give you all the answers that we have. The entity may have a any number of owners. The entity may make these disproportionate allocations, and I think that's distributions. The owner may participate in management while limiting personal liability, and the entity may avoid taxation. Those are our answers to which of the following is an advantage of forming a limited liability company as opposed to a partnership. All right, the answer is C. Okay, let's break this down. Which of the following is an advantage of which of the following is an advantage of forming a limited liability company as opposed to a partnership? Remember, partnerships, what I just talked about partners, partnerships and partners are um, no matter what partner you are, unless you're a limited partner, you have responsibilities of all the debts, right? So therefore, a limited liability company doesn't have that. The, 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 uh, the, their members don't have um, the liability of debts. So therefore, we look. let's look at this. The entities may have any number of owners. We know that's not true because a partner, the limited liability doesn't have one owner unless it's a partnership, right? That's going, that's out. All right. The other one that I probably will put out was entity may avoid taxation. That's number. That's D. We know that's not true. So now we have B and C. The entity may make disproportionate allocations, and I think that's distributions. I think that's what it is. So that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the case. So the answer would be C. The owner may participate in management while limiting their liability, their personal liability. Because remember, partnerships are the ones who. Um, Oh, that's a good, that's a good. But if the LLC is found to be commingling funds, I think the liability is no longer valid. That's called piercing the corporate veil. You're right, LaShawn. That's called piercing the corporate veil. If you see that a LLC, and that's another, you know, a situation, but if you see an LLC that's commingling funds, that means personal account, you're using personal accounts for business, you're using business accounts for personal, then if they, if they can, if a, a, a courts can see that you pierce the corporate veil, then they can make you liable, personally liable. So remember that, but that's good. All right, uh, let's go on. Okay. Wow, a lot of that going on. Oh yeah, Karen, you have no idea. A lot. That's why I tell my clients, don't commingling. Do not commingle funds. 
Because honestly, I've been to situations like that where I've been to court with um with a sole proprietor, I mean, a member, and they said, oh, you know, I got I got an LLC. Well, if they can show that you Pierce Corbell, which means that they can show that you use personal funds for your business and but from your personal account and you use business funds, use bi your business account for personal use, they can say you Pierce the corporate veil, which means you are pretty much putting yourself as a personal, you, you, you make, you put yourself and your business together. And that's how they end up saying that they're going to take your children, your family, your house, everything else, because you did that. So just because you have an LLC does not mean that you're not, you, you may not be totally responsible if you are commingling funds. So LaShawn, that's a, that's a great um, example. All right. So we went through all of the entities. Well, the entities that, you know, you do have some entities out there for state purposes. We're not going to talk about that because we're talking about tax purposes. So now let's talk about record keeping because we know that's the biggest thing when it comes down to entities, when it comes down to businesses, is record keeping. You have to make sure that your taxpayers are you are required to provide certain expenses. They're required to keep adequate records in order to substantiate their deductions if they are audited by the IRS. Okay, you guys know that. Let me give you. Let me give you an example. I can't stand to hear it, but this is what the IRS says. And you guys are here when you become EAs. What's what's that? And you probably already heard it. Um, invoice plus method of payment equals substantiation. One of them. I remember I went to. Went to an audit. Um, I don't do very much anymore, but one of them I went to an audit and she was, and she had it up there. It says entity, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It says invoice plus method of payment equals substantiation. I was like, she's like, look here, look at here, look at this. Because my client didn't have very much, very many invoices. They had like method of payment, but they didn't have invoices. I hate to hear somebody say that. But I say it to myself because the IRS says it. That's what it says. So you got to make sure your clients have proper record keeping, adequate records. And I said expenses and receipts are canceled checks or bills to support the expenses. That's equal docu documentary evidence. That's what they call it. Also, don't forget, don't forget, if you are, for document evidence, if it's not required, if the expenses is other than lounging, it's less than $75. OK, there also is three year statute of limitations on when they can audit you. Most people keep their receipts for three years. I am big on that. I keep my receipt for six years because I know about fraud. So I keep my receipts for six years. Um, and also there's also some limitations where if you don't file your returns or if you um, if there is some fraud things going on or I can't remember which one It's no limits. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's if you don't file your returns and if you. If you're, oh, I got it. I got to find it. I'm sorry. I got to find it. But it's if you file your returns and something else, there's no limits. I think it's wrong, but there's no limits on certain things. And we'll get to that in a minute. So proving expenses, proving expenses. Okay. So like I said here, council, council checks or method of payment plus bills or invoices equals substantiation. All right. If no supporting, doc well, I won't say no supporting, they have to have supporting documents. I won't even say that no supporting documents. But what they need to do is this. If you don't have the council checks or you, you need the method of payment, because most of the time you can find the method of payment on your checks, right? On your checking account. But what about if you don't have an invoice? There, You need to make sure your clients understand. There is a spreadsheet they need to do. Some clients do it weekly, right? They'll do it weekly. Like this is what, um, this is one of the charts that you may be able to use. Expense types. Amounts, the time, um, description of what they what they did, and the purpose. They gotta have the business purpose. You gotta have the business purpose because you have to show, according to IRC one sixty two, that you have a business purpose in your relationship. So what you want to do is keep your clients abreast and say, hey, if you do not, you know, you're supposed to have method of payment and invoice equal substantiation, but also you need to keep records. Just in case you lose that one of those substantiations, just in case you lose that bill or invoice, you got to have the payment because, like I said, you need to have, you, you can have your checking account or whatever. Most people use that. Most people don't do cash anymore. So, therefore, you will have that on your on your bank account. But if you don't have, a, if you don't have a bill, people don't understand it. If you don't have a bill, there's ways you can do things, which is this. It's a chart. 
put the chart together and don't do the chart the same. Like you can't do the chart when you get audited. Shoot, you can't even, I can't even remember what I did yesterday. Let's own what I did, what I did uh, three years ago or two years ago. Y'all know they don't come back for like two or two years right before it's time for you to the three years. Then they come back on, they come back and audit your client. So make sure your clients are using something like this, like a spreadsheet where it says expense type. What's they type? Traveling gifts, auto, supplies, whatever it was. Um, I don't know, legal fees, whatever it is, the amount they use, the time, the date and time, or just the, I mean, and that mean time means date, the description of what it is, and then the business purpose. And, so, and you can get some substantiations through that way, okay? And that may be something that's on the exam. So don't forget about that. But we're going to talk about that more when we get in Vegas. I'm so excited about Vegas. Okay. Here is it right here. Oh, it is. It's fraudulent, fraudulent return. I knew it was one of them. Okay. So if you owe additional taxes or if you owe this, there's a three-year statute of limitations. If you did not report income over 25%, they can actually do a six-year statute of limitations. That's why I always say six years. Filing a fraudulent return, there's no limit. Did not file, there's no limit. People don't get that. People actually, people, it's crazy how people want to, and also the statute of limitations on the 10 years of, you know, we're not going to go into that, but 10 years of um, of the, of, 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 of paying the bill, they want to say, oh, it, it should my 10 years be up? You didn't file a return. You don't even get no years. There's no limit because you didn't file a return. And then you have um, filed the claim for refund, you know, that's later of three years or two years after it's been paid. And then the work for securities is seven years. So remember that. So my thing, my, I feel like six years. I think, you know, I know it's three years, but I think everybody should keep their documentation for at least six years. And also scan in it, because scan in documentation. IRS does not really care how you do it, right? They don't really care how you keep your documents. So we have now all the technology. And I don't understand how people bring me receipts where it's faded. Scan the documents in, have your clients scan, make sure they scan them in, and they um they keep records of them. Put them, put them somewhere. I mean, I do every year. Every year I have I 2024. And I put what I do, and I'm and I'm gonna just tell you guys it's just for some this for kicks and giggles. I will go back 2024 and I'll use my I'm 1120s. I'll use all the line items for 1120s and put a folder there. And as I as I scan the stuff in, I just put them in there. And then at the end of the year, I don't have to worry about doing so much. I also keep spreadsheets. I'm a big, I'm a big person on spreadsheets. So I keep spreadsheets. Or there are so many spreadsheets out there now where you can you can get a, a, a program and it'll do it for you. So just remember that. All right. Oh, am I finished? Really? 44, 41 minutes. I did good. Okay. So I think Melinda, Melinda has, yeah, Melinda got me. She got me. She got me. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Car parts. A, cor a C corporation ends its year on October 30th. When must car parts income tax return be filed for the year ending October 30th, 2024? Oh, that's good. So that's a good one because I didn't I didn't go over the uh, <laughs> the tax returns for 1120s and 1120s is when they should be filed. I think somebody already went over that though, but I didn't go over that. But this is a good question. So. Car parts, a C corporation ends its tax year on October the 30th. When must car parts, parts, income tax return be filed for the year ending October 30th, Okay, so we only got hey some of y'all ain't some of y'all ain't responding, but it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Are you getting ready to go back, Melinda? Huh? Are you getting no, ready to go back? we're we're done. I'm out now. We're done. Oh, I knew you. It's okay. Lashawn that you can you can finish the poll, Josie. Okay, so the the answer is C. Okay, it's C. 
Remember you guys, and like I said, I didn't go over this, but this is a good question to, to make make us talk about this. A yeah, they should know this. They're tax yes. professionals. We should we all should know what this is yes. if you're preparing taxes. Yes. So remember it's the is the is it's the fourth month, the fifteenth day of the fourth month after they close their business. So October, that'll be why I can't act like I don't know. November, December, January, February fifteenth. That's how it comes up to see. So remember, you guys know it's not April 15th because April 15th, a corporation, if, if the only time they have April 15th is if it was December the 31st, which is still four months, right? So regardless of when, when it is, it's still going to be four months after the close. Remember that corporations are different. See, corporations are different. It's four months after they close their the tax year. So it'll be, it'll be um, February the 15th. All right. Before we talk about the um, boot camp in Vegas, someone took part one today. LaShawn, is is she on? I think is it is it. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, she she's there. Hey, hey LaShawn, can you turn one. your video on? I'm gonna stop sharing. Hey. Hey, can, you, can you tell us about part one? <laughs> what did you do? You know, what let me it? let me pull over. It, it's a whole. You know what? It's a whole thing. <laughs> I did a uh, post about it in the group. I was extremely nervous to take this exam. Um, I had, you know, I've been preparing, preparing taxes for a while. So I had an idea in my head of how it was going to go. And when I started getting into the study questions, I realized that, you know, I was dealing with one specific type of tax client and, you know, very specific scenarios. So I didn't, deal with inheritance and gift taxes and foreign exclusion credits and like it's just a lot of information mm -hmm. and so one part of me is like I'm really glad I'm getting this because I kind of have been doing a disservice to my clients by not having all the information that I can I feel very empowered with this information um the exam was it was intense okay because <laughs> when you go to the office it's it, the security is really like on point, oh, yeah. like she, I she had it's me take like off you're my going glasses. on the air flight, on the airplane, right? Right. Checkpoint. She had me take yep. off my glasses, my bracelet, everything, very secure. Everything had to go in your locker. Um, I don't know how detailed you want me to get, but you know, uh, the most. Uh, I, I just, I just right. want people to understand yeah. that it doesn't matter how long you've been preparing taxes, how long you've been in the tax industry. This EA exam is a whole nother ball game. It's a lot of stuff. I had been doing taxes for over 15 years, but when I started studying for the EA exam, I was like, ooh, we, I've been doing that wrong. Like it's it's a lot that we don't know when you're studying for the EA exam. It's a lot. It is definitely a lot. And uh, it was very helpful what you had mentioned in the group about the brain dump that really helped me because I already had all these formulas in my head. I wrote it down. And then as I got into the questions, I forgot it. It was like completely like, what was it? So I was able to go back like, okay, that was 250000 for that. So that was extremely helpful. Um, flagging the questions. But definitely to reiterate your point, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. I guarantee it's a lot of stuff you've never seen before. It's a lot of things I thought I knew. That when I went into it, I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. So, um, yeah, but I'm very happy to be getting this EA. Like, I'm very happy. So, thank you for creating this awesome. and these resources. Extremely helpful. Did you pass part one? I passed. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm so happy. I awesome. 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 That's amazing. So, now you can focus. Which one are you going to do next? Are you going to do part three or part two? I think that I'm going to go with the, I'm not sure, the representation. Is that part two? Part three. Part three. Part three. Okay. I'm going to uh -huh. go with the representation. My goal is to finish by the summer. Um, okay. So I want to do the representation and then I'm going to save part three for the end because that's the one I feel like I'm going to need a lot more uh, time and patience with. Part two. Yeah. That's the most challenging part for almost everybody because is that business? that's business yes part sorry, two this is somebody business. else told me that somebody, another EA mm -hmm. told me the same thing that part part she was gonna wait for part two to be last because it was business 
Yeah, because that's that's where you have to know bases. You have to know um, estates, farming, all the stuff that we don't do on a day to day basis. You have to know it to pass that EA exam. Good. Somebody yeah. asked, well, I'm glad you asked. passed. Congratulations, congratulations, that's amazing. Thank you. Someone asked Thank a question you. about the trick. Were there were the questions just as tricky as the practice test? Yeah, and I do want to say this because you have to really read these questions. It, it was one question specifically that it was like, it was such a common sense question, but the way they worded it, it was like, you have to read it like three times to understand what they're actually saying. And if I would have got that wrong, I would have been mad. But it, it's like something we would all know, but the way they had it worded, it was like, what? So it's definitely tricky. You have to take your time. You got to go back. You got to read it. And it, I was even saying, mark it off. Like, what are they not saying? Like, what, what exactly are they asking for? Yep. That's what I heard. That's, that's, that's why motivation. I told, yeah. yeah, that's why I was telling everybody, before you read the entire question, go down to the, the actual question and see what question that they're asking you. That way, when you're getting ready to read the full question, you're already knowing your head, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. Because it's going to be some stuff in the question that you're not going to need. Yeah, yeah. Someone asked, how much time do they allocate, did they allocate for you? How much time do they allocate for the part, part, part one? I think it was three yeah. hours. I want to say yeah. it was three it's, hours. It's three hours. Three hours. Mm -hmm. It's three hours. Okay. That's really each, good each to know. Each part is three hours, Karen. Okay. Um, yep, all of them are three hours. I think okay. it's, it, it schedules for like three hours and... 45 minutes or three hours and 30 minutes, but they're taking the survey that you have to go through into consideration. I mean, this is it's well, really good. good to hear perspective from someone else who just yes. took you to understand that this is no joke. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why this is being done. I mean, we're talking about this is snippets of what we're going to give you guys compared to what we're going to do in Vegas. This is just little stuff. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, you we'll, can yeah, talk we'll about second. Yeah, Vegas. I'm, Second questions. I'm, I'm, I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I train myself with the bar and stuff like that. I love doing that. So yeah, we will. We will, Karen. We will do. I, I, de I know. I definitely will do. It. I think. I know everybody else will do it too. All the other instructors. Yeah, and that's why it's important for you all to participate in those um, tax trivia questions that I post every day. Like you, that's that's the prime reason why you need to do those questions. Yeah. Okay. All right, sis, you can move forward with the boot camp. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so thank you guys so much. I know it was really fast. It probably some of the stuff you probably already know, but we want to get you guys, um, you know, get you guys ready for Vegas because it's going to be way more than it. All right, so the three-day uh, EA boot camp is going to be in Vegas, Vegas, Vegas. Yes, we are so excited. We are so excited. Um. I think these are the rooms, you guys, if anybody, I don't know if everybody's been on here, but everybody know how bougie Melinda is. So these are, the these are the rooms. I'm pretty sure right now she's, I don't know if she's in a Marriott or not. She loves Marriott, so I don't know if she's in a Marriott in California. You all? Yeah, we, we we travel, we go to Marriott. I'm a, I'm a Hilton girl. She's like, I'm Marriott. I love Marriott. So, yeah. So these are um, the hotel that we're going to stay in. I'm pretty sure everybody got their hotel. I think there was a post that tomorrow is the last day. Is that right? Tomorrow is you, um, if you have Yes. Tomorrow is the last day. I'm trying to get a one-week extension because this that week that we're in Vegas is also the fight week that I knew nothing about. So it's going to be a lot of celebrities. Aria is one of the top hotels oh, yeah, where yeah. all the celebrities stay. So if you are serious about joining us in Vegas, I highly recommend you look in your room before we're sold, we're sold out or before the cutoff time um, is here. Yeah, so it's the Aria Hotel. I know I saw someone inside the group saying that they had they were coming by themselves. So anybody's like that, you know, I think that's good to know that it's other people that's going to come by themselves as well so you guys can partner up or whatever so that's really good i think that was good for her to put that out there all right so next we have oh can i play the video i never can play the video i hate that you don't have to you can skip the video okay. all right so these are what's included is this still the same everything's still the same okay ea review material 
all three parts available to you until you pass. That is major. You know what? That is major. We have to take an exam. We didn't get one time you pass, and you have to get you have to take it over. And so that that's really good. Study guides, um, um, concise video lectures, review questions. You know, she's putting questions out there right now all the time. Every I think two or three times a day, y'all answer those questions. Even if you don't, this is the thing. There's nothing wrong. We're not judging you here. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. We will get you the answer. We'll help you decipher the answer. What do we have to do? Just make sure you're answering the questions. At least think about the answer and how you're going to, you know, decipher the answer when you're actually there because that's the best thing. I'm telling you, practice makes perfect. So answer those questions inside the group. Unlimited EA practice examinations. Um, study anywhere. That's going to be good. Um, and online instructor support. That's us. We're here to support you. Like I said, we're not going to judge none of us. All of us are awesome. They've all taken the e-exam. I would love to just take just to take it, but I'm not because I already took two bars. I'm not going to do it. But I would love to just take it to see, you know, see if I can pass it because it ain't no joke from what I heard. And from what I see, I've been through the material. It's a lot. It's a lot. So um, we are here for you guys all the time. That is good. You're not going to get that for what you guys are, are, are paying for it. Um, also, um, licensed instructor cheat sheets. Oh, Jeopardy. I can't wait for Jeopardy, you guys. Oh my, I'm so excited about Jeopardy. I love Jeopardy. I don't, we never know the answers on Jeopardy, but I'm gonna know them this time. <laughs> but anyway, so join the Facebook group. I'm pretty sure everybody's already in the Facebook group. And then you also have a cram course in December. No additional charges. That is amazing. Career opportunities. I've always told everybody, I don't work for anybody but EAs. And people, you know, you can come in. I mean, we get yeah, part time work for my firm, but I only hire EAs. Mentorships as well. I think one that's one of something I'm going to do, probably like an internship or something for an EA who may be taking the exam and, and won't have some extra work to do because that'll be, I think that'll be good for you guys as well as my firm. So think about putting something like that together. Register, 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 but do not forget, you got to go ahead and book. Hopefully, Melinda can get. An extra week, but just in case you can't, y'all need to go ahead and book those rooms. Um, discounted group rates five or more. So if you got a group, bring them on. Hotel rates, like we just talked about. Um, the EA exam, you got also the in the, the cram course in December. And then pay vacation. You get a deduction from this. Everyone knows you get it. Everyone knows you get a deduction from this. Air for a hotel, you get a deduction. $1,995. I think we even had a $200 off last week. That would, that would have taken it down to $17.95. That's so, I mean, she's doing everything, man. I swear to get, this is amazing. So you guys, please jump on this. Melinda, One more thing. I um, have a few different things that we're doing. One, if you are like LaShawn and you only need to um, study for um, either part two or part three, you won't have to pay the full price to come to Vegas. Um, send me an email and I'll determine which part that you need and you only pay for that part. So that's for people that has already passed. Um, the second awesome. offer, we have extended the $200 discount to next Friday. I'm telling you, that's it. I, mark my words. I am not offering the discount after next Friday. We're almost sold out the, with the hotel rooms. If you are serious about becoming an EA, you need to register by next Friday. If you don't register by next Friday, I'm going to assume that you're not serious about becoming an enrolled agent because why else wouldn't you come to Vegas? Um, last thing is if you already have Fast Forward Academy materials, we are discounting that down as well. Um, send me a separate email and I'll send you that discount code. I think it was discounted down to $14.95, but we still gave you $200 off of that. So $12.95. So if you already got fast forward materials, you're not paying $19.95 or $17.95. You're paying $12.95. That ends next Friday. After next Friday, I don't have any sympathy for anybody. Oh, the last thing, and this is why I don't have any sympathy if you don't sign up after next Friday. There are three payment installment plans that you can make, $695.
pay it three times and you're in there. So I've done all I can do. I can't do anything else. That's it. <laughs> Melinda, that was also, is it online as well? Like you can, is it online as well? Did you virtual? It's virtual, yes. The, um, so, the, so but yes, it, it's offered virtually. The bootcamp is offered virtually, but the price is still the same whether you attend in person or um, attend virtually. But LaShawn said that she's interested in the opportunity to practice um. And the only way the only way you can do that if you um if you're already in our program. So yeah, I'm you have to, to be you, trained yeah, by you have us. To be in the program mm -hmm. in order for me to be able to let you. But I, I am definitely my firm is definitely willing to allow you to do some represent practice representation. But you have right. to be in the program because I yeah. know that you're gonna pass. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I want EAs, so I you know I want, I'm eventually gonna have EAs and hire them. So I want people I know who are gonna pass, and I know this program right. will, you will pass from this program. So yeah. And um, Joy yep. said discovery retain is 1500 investment comes back quickly. Oh, yes, it does. Discovery and prices have buy, increased. So. My, dis my discovery is 3000 now, y'all. The and, prices yeah. have increased. And I think mine was like, yeah, mine was 2500 When I was doing the real resolution, it was 2500 So, yeah, day, like you couldn't even come. You could, I wasn't getting up out of my bed for less than $2,500. Nope. 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 Okay, that's all I have. Um, when you become licensed, you can be like me, Josie, Lissandra, and George. We travel everywhere. Oh, wait a minute. I think I saw um, Ronnie on. Is Ronnie still on? Yes, if she's you're on. Not aware, Yay. Okay, hey, Ronnie, turn your video on. Yeah, so we can see you. Ronnie I'm done. Ronnie is a former IRS um, revenue agent. I'll let her tell you all. Let me see. Is she still on? She's on. Mm hmm Hey, Remy. I think her. she's on mute. Oh, I see her. You see her? You're on mute if you're trying to talk. She may be in a meeting or something, yeah. but we have a, oh, there it is. There she goes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm trying to work with this Zoom stuff. You know, I'm not that good at it. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Can you Introduce guys hear me? yourself. We can hear you, but I, I can't see you. Okay, I can see you now. Introduce yourself see. and let them know. Let me see if I can background. change this. How does this look? Am I still too dark? I'm too dark, huh? A little bit. Oh boy. Yeah. Let me try to get this together. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm in a new environment. So this is my first time zooming in this space. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know it was this dark. I do apologize. That's okay. That's okay. We well, understand. I'm excited about seeing everybody in Vegas when I get an opportunity to meet uh, everyone. I am Ronnie Hines. It's LaRonya Hines. Everyone calls me Ronnie. And I, I was a California State Franchise Tax Board Senior Compliance Representative for eight years. That's where my career in tax started with the State of California Franchise Tax Board. If you know anything about California state tax and other states like New York, <laughs> those are, that's, some, that's boot camp for real. <laughs> so um, at working um, with the State of California, I was a field agent, so I was out in the field more. I left from eight years to, and went to work for the IRS as an auditor initially. So I was the IRS agent, an auditor. And then I moved from that after four years to being an IRS appeals officer that settled cases for the United States tax court for another eight years. So I had a 12 year career with the IRS. And that's where I learned most of my tax law. And that's where I received my EA grandfathered in. I didn't have to test for it. So developing my content, I'm making sure I'm developing in a way that matters for the test because I, I just learned everything by way of once you work for the U.S. tax court, you cover every aspect of tax law and you play by the <laughs> what appeals is if, in, in case um, people who are not aware, because everybody knows what a revenue officer is. They do collections and a revenue agent does audit. But appeals, they trump the IRS. They, they have the ability to trump the IRS assessment from an auditor. So it's like it's like tax law mediation. And the appeals officer has the ability. So when you settle cases for the United States tax court, you're like, you're doing mediation between the IRS and then there's a, a I, the, I'm sorry, the IRS exam is what they call it. The auditor is the examiner. So you're in between the examination division and the tax attorney, IRS tax attorney division, district council, that if you can mediate the situation, then the 
uh, taxpayer will be happy. IRS district counsel, who's the attorney, will agree. And then the tax court judge will sign off on your settlement and that makes it final. So that's how that works. And that's where I got most of my expertise. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we're excited to have you on board yes, yes, and we, we are, are going to plug you in to do um, one of these master classes. So yes, I'll get with you on that. Um, do we have any questions before we log off? That wasn't on. It was three of them. What did oh, he George, what George, George, he, George, um, George was saying he was talking, he had fun. He loved talking to with the tax court judge today. He said judges. It was judges. Oh, I said which one? Oh, he said, he's yeah, he's he's at a, I think George is at an ABA meeting this week. Yeah, he's at the ABA meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, yeah, it, mm -hmm, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. when y'all become enroll agents, I encourage you all to do these meetings and masterminds that we're doing. Um I'm in California right now at a mastermind. George is in um are you in DC, George? Where where's the ABA meeting? ABA is American Bar Association, D.C., yep. He's in D.C. And I'll be in D.C. Um, at the EA, um, the uh, National Association of Enrolled Agents. They're having a fly-in in, at the end of May, and I'll be there in, um, in D.C. at the end of May. So it's a lot of opportunities. After you become an EA, a whole world of opportunities open up, and we all are excited to help you all start your EA journey. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we don't have any more meetings, I am um, going to log off to go have me some fun. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you guys so much. You have a great afternoon, night. All right. Thank See y'all next, next Thank Thursday. Thank you, Chelsea, for an amazing uh, presentation today. All right. Have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye.